This afternoon we have Andy McClure with us and Andy is a maintenance administrator with Collins Park Water Treatment Plant. Wanted to talk about some of the changes to the plant over the past decade. Thanks for coming in today. It's interesting. Uh, my son is in a similar line, line of business. It's, it's fascinating what you all do with water to make sure it's drinkable. All the things that you have to do to process it and add two things to it. How are things changed now than they were 10 years ago? So, yeah, compared to 10 years ago, um, of course, there's the stuff that we did right away within nine months. Um, the in, improved carbon feed, improved chlorine feed. Um, but there's been, you know, the really big changes. We've improved the treatment process. We went through the capital improvement program, um, tweaked in and really made improvements to settling basins, uh, to the flocculators. Um, and the, the biggest improvement or the biggest change was adding the ozonation process. Has technology, uh, you probably know the history of it too, with the technology from 50 years ago to, to 10 years ago to now, has it all changed and gotten better and better and better in how we treat our water? Yeah, there's, um, there's certainly the main process, you know, settling things out of the water. That hasn't changed too much, but we have improved it and tweaked it. But uh, ozone, um, the, because of HAB events, uh, we probably got ozone about five or 10 years sooner than we would have anyhow. But the ozonation is really, that's, um, it was the blue ribbon panel recommendation. Uh, and that is the, the, you know, like a best available technology is what they call it, is the barrier for the HABs. And ozone is just a really aggressive oxidizer and it breaks those HABs, you know, if they're present, if they're there, it breaks them down into um, uh, non-toxic um, element and non-toxic materials. Um, and then they end up actually getting, become food for bacteria that are in our filters now. And that's another advancement to have the biologically active filters that we didn't have before. The water intake, that had been a really old one. Do we have a new water intake or, or where are we no. with that? So uh, give me a picture in my head how far out that is in the lake. And it takes water in to the water treatment and then it starts being filtered. Yeah, so the, the intake crib, um, it, it was located in 1931. They knew where the location was gonna be and they didn't get around to building it until the 1940s. Um, but it's, it's at one of the deepest spots in the western basin of Lake Erie, and it's also in a location that it's close enough to shore where it's economical for us to construct you sure. know, the tunnel to get out to it, but it's still not totally under the influence of the Maumee River. So the Lake Erie is you know, the western basin. It's a combination of that really pristine water coming down from the upper Great Lakes and the water we see coming out of the Maumee River. So it's located, so we're trying to get the best of both worlds, where it's economic, it's close enough, but we're also getting the influence of that. And the, the intake crib itself hasn't changed much, um, but what's changed on the lake is we've got the early warning system. We've got the um, data signs on the buoys that tell us what the conditions are in the lake. And that was the, one of the biggest changes from 2014. We now know what's going on in the lake as it's going on, as things change. So that bloom that was out there, we would have had prior knowledge of it, we could have adjusted treatment sooner, we could have slowed down treatment, we could have done something different, but um, as it was, we didn't know about it until it really hit the plant. And at that point, just because of the volume of water that's stored in the raw water mains and the intake tunnel, we've got several hours of water already then that we have to adjust the treatment for. The algal blooms, we see them on top of the water, but yes. is the water below it bad too? So like if, let's say you've got, you've got the intake maybe 20, 30 feet deep, uh, is that water going to be a lot better than the water up top around that the floaters? Yeah, the, the water quality we do pull from the bottom, um, and the water quality is much better. It's about 24 feet of water, and the problem is when you get um, an algae bloom that's thick at the surface, and then it's so thick that you actually have some of the algae dying off, and the, when the algae dies off and you get it's called lysis, the cells actually break open and the toxins get into the water. That's really when don't we have a that. problem. Right, we don't, our, our goal when we are, bring, and it does, the, head, the cyanotoxins, they, part of why they can compete better, they can actually change where they are in the water column. So they can go to the surface to get the sunlight and then they come down to the bottom later in the day when the sun's gone to get other nutrients. So, um, but yeah, normally the water is much better um, at the bottom, but it, it can go throughout the water column. We are so lucky where we live that we have Lake Erie because yes. uh, I know down in Columbus they rely on, on uh, river water down there uh, and that is a whole different animal. Of course, you've got your aquifers in other parts of Ohio and Indian, Indiana, but uh, 
how much easier does it make your job that it is out of Lake Erie? I mean, there's challenge with Lake Erie with, sure. with farm runoff, but still it's a huge body of water that you can do something with it and make sure that the drinking water is safe. Yeah, we, so you're right, it, it's, a, it's a dual-edged sword. On the one hand, um, we have essentially an infinite supply of fresh water to treat, to make into potable water, you know, for drinking water. But on yeah. the other hand, um, it is subject to seasonal problems based on the nutrient load, um, from agricultural runoff, you know, from what is in uh, the Maumee River as it, as it blends in with uh, the western basin of Lake Erie. And, and as the water temperature increases and the conditions are right and those habs develop. About 30 seconds left, but uh, what do you see in about 10 years, 20 years with the technology and how we treat our water? Um, so right now we have early warning systems that we use to, they predict if there's harmful algal blooms yet or not. And they're really refining whether it says, yes, this is a harmful algal bloom. Um, and the, the ozone treatment has really been very, very beneficial. Game changer. Yep, and really comes down to some of the technology within the plant. Because the ozone works so quickly, we're trying to optimize it, um, but we feel like we're overfeeding a little bit, but we'd rather be on air on the side of caution and overfeed. But it's, it's the technology really in, in detecting the halves real time. And we, we've improved over the ELISA test a little bit that takes you know eight hours. There's four, four six, eight hours to get a good result. So we, we are getting better, but that's, that's one of the big ones. The, where you can know instantaneously how much HAB's in the water. Andy, fascinating to talk with you about this, the technology, but the, right. the bottom line is our water is very our safe. Is Thanks safe. for being with us yep. today.